welcome uh, everyone good evening uh, i'm kushal one of the co-founders at pm school and uh, welcome to the star lecture for this week uh, where we invite an expert from the industry to share their wisdom knowledge um, and expertise in the product uh, and design uh, product design uh, and technology uh, in the in the space of building great software products so uh, welcome again um, just a little bit of pm school uh, so we've been around for over uh, slightly over 4 years now the pm school is the largest uh, community in asia uh, to help aspiring product managers bag their uh, dream product manager job and uh, we have a 8 week cohort uh, program uh, a live cohort program where you're assigned uh, a ment a one on one mentor and uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, i would say attention uh, given or you have a lot of mentor uh, hands on ment mentorship provided to help you gain uh, the expertise and skill set required to crack your dream product manager jobs uh, if you have any questions you can reach out to priyal from my team uh, she'll be dropping a message at the end of the lecture um, or you can reach out to any one of us from uh the pm school team um you know either on linkedin or um uh, or uh, the mail which priyal is going to send out at the end of the lecture so with that i hand it over to rohan uh, who is going to talk everything about first principle thinking design thinking on all the frameworks that's uh, required for you to execute on on this this particular type of uh, mental model and thought process in the uh, uh in the pursuit of building uh, products which users need and products which succeed so with that i hand it over to rohan today welcome rohan thanks for being here yeah thank you thank you kushal for uh, the introduction uh so today uh, i'll be talking about first principle thinking and uh, design thinking and the different frameworks uh and uh, demystifying them to a bit right wherein uh what are what do these really stand for right uh, how these really came up to be right uh, and uh, what is the specific use case right to use certain frameworks uh, maybe the first principle thinking right uh, how a lot of uh, great entrepreneurs have used it right uh, in their day to day and have solved great up uh, great problems right so uh, yeah that's that's kind of an overview of the topic right a little bit of an introduction about me uh i am basically a self taught designer right uh, and i've had the pleasure to work at great product companies like haptic uh, glance by inmobi and now keto right uh, so yeah uh, a very little amount of knowledge to share here but uh, hope it resonates with everyone and uh, they can get out a little bit out of it uh, at the end of the day right so yeah let's start so uh, in order to understand first principle thinking right we need to get uh, to the basics of it right so let's let's basically start by solving a physics problem right now uh, go back uh, to when you were in the 10th standard or in the 12th standard and you were solving a basic physics problem that would come come to you right uh, it would be something like let's say if it's something specific to force mass and acceleration right which is uh and the question would be around what is the acceleration of a 25 kg box that has uh, has 50 newton of force applied to the right right and what would the acceleration come out to be is what the solution would be required right and then how would you go about solving such a problem right now as i remember when i was uh, in the 10th and 12th standard i would first figure out the data right the given data what's the force it's 15 newton right what's the mass it's about 25 kgs right and apply a certain formula right force is equal to mass into acceleration and find out and figure out that the acceleration is about uh 2 meter per second square right now this is just an analogy to help you understand first principles even better and i'll uh, get to it in a bit right first principle thinking specifically but uh let's try to understand the entire process right what you would do is note the given right the given as in the facts that have been mentioned in the problem statement right like i mentioned the force and the mass right 
the second uh, thing you would do is figure out which concept is this from and then take a formula and apply it right you would input the data and then get a solution right this is what you would do to solve a basic physics problem right now how does all of this come to and get to first principle thinking right now whenever we look at any sort of problem statement that exists right uh, whatever we do is right how can we figure out those two exact facts or two or four exact facts that are the guiding principles for any problem statement right so the purpose of first principle thinking as a whole is to get away from all of the assumptions right so get away from saying that your preconceived notions right saying that maybe this is something that will work maybe this is something that won't work right and asking the why of any problem statement or any statement for that matter multiple times until and unless you read the absolute truths of it right now uh, in theory this is pretty much easy right now let's try to take it to a problem statement and figure things out so uh, in the earlier days right people would say that uh, boards can be made only from wood right this is said, said by someone uh, before uh, newer and better and more efficient versions of boards were made right uh, this was said by someone right and now as a first as a naive thinker i would say that uh, boards can be made only from wood because i've seen wood uh, directly floating on water right now taking it back and looking at it in a first principle lens how would you go about doing this right and that's when you would uh, ask these following questions right the first would be care why are these boards even made out of wood right so i would say care yeah maybe because wood floats right now then you would try to understand it even deeper right why does even uh, wood float right because of its weight density right now can we reduce the weight density of different materials based on uh, us understanding wood at a deeper level right maybe to some extent right and then can the board be designed in such a way that uh, and can materials be used such that the weight weight density is less right can the design the weight density the buoyancy right uh, all the first principles that require a boat to float right can they be utilized to a different material and uh, can it can uh, boats be made out of iron uh, right so and the answer was yes yes right boats can be made cheaper and much more efficient with uh, by using iron right so uh, that's a first principle way of thinking and rather not a uh, way of analogy right now let's try to understand uh, post this what first principle principle thinking is not right we want to should what decently well in terms of what first principle thinking is with a smaller example right uh, but what first principle thinking is not is thinking by analogy is not first principle thinking right now what do i mean by analogy right so let let's take a very specific example and let's elaborate on it uh, so that you understand uh, right so let's take a very simple analogy right let's say i'm a fintech founder right uh, and i see phone pay has launched upi uh, feature as a fintech company right and uh, if i am if i think by analogy i would say ki we should do it too right because we are a fintech company right phone pay has done it uh, we should do it too right but if you would think by first principles it would be much different right you would try to understand why phone pay as a company has launched upi right and what is the specific use case that upi solves right so uh, first principle thinking would be phone pay launched upi as a fintech company right why did they do it right uh, is it solving for a specific use case that is high repeat rate so that they want a lot of users to come onto the platform and keep transacting because they see that upi payment is a daily use case right is that something is that the reason why phone pay is even uh, launching upi right and then the second question could be here can this specific feature add value to our audience right and uh, there could be even deeper questions along the lines of your audience right 
that could give you, give you much better clarity and can get to get, uh, get you to more of the facts right and rather than just relying on assumptions a lot right so yeah that's like not thinking from analogy and uh, thinking from first principles right a little bit of a difference i feel uh, a lot of these concepts are things that we don't even realize when we are doing it uh, but uh, i feel it's good practice to start uh, thinking about it and utilizing it in our daily lives, right? So, yeah. So now a food for thought, right? So uh, I feel the way to look into uh, any sort of company culture, right? And uh, take care, is this does this company even think first principles? Is a very interesting analogy that I have is, does this company think in terms of ideas or do they discuss problems, right? Because ideas are always forms of analogy, right? But problems are things that you've noticed as facts from your target user persona, right? So yeah, that's, that's one part of uh, it. The second part of it is if you look at Elon Musk pretty, uh, if you notice him, right? And the kind of problems he solves, if you look at Tesla, right? Uh, if you look at SpaceX, right, these two are companies that have been successful because of first principle thinking, because there is a high amount of use of physics in the success of that moonshot, right? Uh, it's not that he's looking at user personas and figuring out a solution. It's basically is creating a product that is being made much better, right? Just give you an example, right? A lot of people before before Elon Musk made Tesla said that electric cars were super expensive, right? And Elon Musk went and figured out here, thought by first principles and said, here, if I look at first principles for making a battery, right? And I look at the individual components, right? Can I figure out that one specific component that is super expensive and break the entire, entire uh, statement saying that electric cars are expensive, right? And by the physics way of doing things, right, he could crack that problem and therefore Tesla could become such a successful company, right? So yeah, uh, just some food for thought, right? Now, uh, what uh, the problems and the drawbacks with first principle thinking, let's come to that as well, right? Now, with first principle thinking, since it's like the physics way of thinking, right? It's super idealistic, right? Uh, saying that, yeah, I know these specific facts based on which I will build up and up and try to solve a problem, right? But if you look at even user experience design or even product management, right? You are always dealing with creating a new sort of user behavior, right? And getting to the facts is super difficult, right? Uh, getting to the facts is super difficult because every person or every user persona is very different. Right? You can find an 80-20 thing wherein 80% of people have a certain behavior, but that still can't be considered as facts. Right? Therefore, very few facts can be found while you are uh, either creating user experiences or doing any sort of product management. Right? Hence, any sort of uh, every time you launch a product, assumptions need to be made. Right? Now, uh, moving on from first principle thinking and the transition is pretty clear because what first principle thinking doesn't solve for is what IDEO went ahead and solved for is with design thinking, right? They said that you frame a certain question, uh, you gather some sort of inspiration, you generate ideas, right? Figure out a problem, create a specific process to uh, launching new ideas, right? Test to learn and then you can uh, launch it and iterate on the product, right? The core philosophy here is basically that you make your assumptions, right? You have an authority or a process to follow saying that these are the four steps that I can use to reach a particular solution, right? And this is my roadmap to reach there, right? Now, the second part of it is uh, very specific to design thinking is here. Don't make again, right? and documenting your assumptions, right? Now, whenever you go through a certain specific process to solve a certain problem, right? You always need to make and document your assumptions just that for the next iteration, right? 
you don't make the same mistakes right and that's what first principle thinking lacked right because it was a very physics and idealistic way of problem solving but wherein ideo came through and said that there is maybe an authority or a structure to follow a process to follow and also on the way it can help you create an iterative process of uh, problem solving right wherein if you look at first principle thinking it's like get the facts get the solution right whereas with uh, design thinking right you will see that it's a very iterative process and it will also uh, help you create uh, products and therefore the product cycle exists right so yeah uh, now uh, what is the specific use case right uh, before getting into this let's let's discuss a little about frameworks as well right now as a user experience designer right uh there are these different kinds of frameworks that we use let's say there's a 5w1h framework wherein you figure out the why what uh where when how right and then you uh, create some sort of a solution right and try to solve for it right now uh how are all of these things things related right you have process ideo saying that maybe there is first principle uh ideo saying that there is design thinking right uh these great inventors saying that there is first principle thinking right there are these different frameworks to use right how do you even go ahead and choose something to make your problem solving much easier right so yeah let's try to understand it from a an analogy perspective right now let's say i am a student right and i want to learn how to play cricket right and uh, i reach out to sachin tendulkar right and i say kyar i want to play a great cover drive right uh, my question would be how do i hit a cover drive right and uh, sachin would be kyar look at the ball right put your front foot forward keep your head above the ball and then just drive right so now this is what sachin tendulkar has taught a student and this is actually a process right wherein sachin tendulkar is telling you to follow a certain specific process to maybe hit a uh, the right cover drive right now if you would look at the second part of it right if i would ask him care what if the ball is short right is short of length like it's pitched a little shorter right how do i go ahead and play that same drive right and that's when you would say kyar maybe get on your toes uh, like sachin tendulkar say kyar maybe get on your toes and keep balance right so uh, this is what you would call a framework right when your when your process is like a very basic uh, way of solving a problem right a much better efficient way or a better use case right uh, like a specific use case if you have like you can solve it with a framework right and that's what the utility of a framework is so uh, what the goal is here your framework changes based on the context of your problem right your process always remains the same right you would always play a cover drive in a certain way but based on the context of a problem right you would always maybe uh, step back a little and play your cover drive or there would be different ways based on the context of the problem that is thrown at you right yeah and finally right uh, if you ask sachin tendulkar right what if the ball is super slow right there are n number of use cases and there are not so many frameworks right and sachin tendulkar will tell you it's all instinct right that he's played so many games he solved so many problems right he's played so many balls that now all of these frameworks processes uh maybe first principle thinking design thinking right all of this is something that he utilizes on a day to day basis for different specific use cases and now it is all uh gotten into instinct right so yeah uh so great instinct is what great processes and frameworks get you right yeah that's that's uh, that's kind of a small talk from me and just one thing to remember use frameworks processes just to make sure just make sure that they don't use you here right because sometimes in the process 
uh, we get so lost at following this process, following this specific framework that we lose sight of the problem, right? And that's like the most important thing to do. Yeah. Thank you guys. Would be open for any sort of questions. Uh, if something was not communicated the right way, uh, would uh, happily open to answer questions. Yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, folks will have some question, follow-up questions on uh, understanding how to use the frameworks and what uh, or the situations to use the right frameworks. Um, uh, please drop in your questions uh, on the chat uh, window. Uh, you can also unmute yourself and drop in uh, your question directly to us. So we have a question coming in from, uh, from Pallavi. So what are the good frameworks to build design thinking? So uh, I feel design thinking, right, as I mentioned, is like a framework or, or a process uh, created by IDEO, right, to help their employees think in, think in a certain way, right? Uh, think of managing culture and managing uh, design or product management in a certain way so that certain culture is created for making products, right? And design thinking is a term created by them, right? Now your question is, what are the good frameworks to build design thinking? I feel, as I mentioned, right, the such an example, it's mostly looking at different problems, right? Having a certain process that you vaguely follow, right? But not sticking to that process and trying to solve different problems as much as possible, right? Now, for example, if you're stuck on a very specific problem, right? You could always reach out to different, you could always look up different frameworks that could help you with that specific problem. Just to give you an example, right? When um, I be I'd been solving this problem at Keto for the loyalty program, right? Wherein uh, you would help increase the retention on the platform, right? Using a certain loyalty program, right? Now, uh, after following the process, right? I got stuck at a place saying that, here, how do I even move forward, right? That's when I looked at. Uh, I found here what would be a good framework to help me uh, solve this specific problem because I'm stuck now, right? And that's when I looked at empathy mapping, right? What would be uh, the, the right moment to create an aha moment for the user, right? Figuring that out with empathy maps is what I did to solve that specific problem, right? So there are a lot of great frameworks that you would basically go ahead and you could look up online, right? But the only way at getting good at design thinking is solving a lot of problems, right? Uh, and then testing out with users and see if you've really solved these problems well, right? So yeah, uh, that's a little bit. How much overlap? is there between common sense and first principle thinking, right? So, um, I don't know, yaar. this is like a very, um, <laughs> very specific question related to uh, common sense and first principle thinking. But uh, yeah, I feel after a point in time, right? When uh, problem solving is more into your instinct, right? It's basically common sense, right? As I mentioned with the such an example, right? You used all of these frameworks when you're a beginner, right? Mostly when you're starting out, a process is for someone who's just starting out, right? But if you'd look at all of these big entrepreneurs, right? A lot of their problem solving happens with their gut, right? Because they have been able to solve so many problems, right? So you would say, Kyar, if someone is a great entrepreneur, right? First principle thinking maybe comes a little naturally to him. He's not always right, right? But uh, definitely has built that sort of instinct to solve uh, problems. Um, tips for documentation. Uh, could you basically uh, elaborate a little more in terms of documentation? Uh, Nitish, I'll take the next question till then. Uh, so, uh, okay. So Nitish says, what should we document? Got it. So, uh, let's say when you, when you're even solving any sort of a problem, right. And you, uh, have understood a user persona. This is specifically talking from, 
me in terms of how i go to solve problems right now uh, i know that looking at a user persona there are some specific facts that i know that are true for this specific users based on the previous iterations that we've done right saying that maybe uh, the user behaves a certain way behaves a certain way at certain time right now in order to build a sol solution right i need to make different assumptions at different points in time right so that i can create some sort of solution and validate those assumptions that i made in the process right so i feel documenting what the fact is right what the assumption is right in terms of what you are making up to say that is true for the user right and then after the entire iteration is done go back and see care is this is this assumption a fact or is this still an assumption right is this a mistake that i'll make next time or is this uh, maybe an assumption that i made that i have validated right so yeah documenting uh, your assumptions is like the most important thing so that you don't make the same mistakes again right if that answers your question nitish uh then it's agrima she says ki yeah, do problems solved by design thinking go through more iterations um i matlab I, this is like a very um uh, like you can't say right maybe if you make the right assumptions if your gut feeling is so right right you can maybe crack the problem with the first instinct right but definitely um, design thinking enables you to not stop at the first iteration right whereas first principle thinking says that it's a very idealistic way so therefore you need to get the solution at the first instinct right whereas with design thinking you see here there are more iterations more uh, chances to figure out what the right answer could be or what the right solution for the specific problem could be right so yeah uh can we use first principle in decision making and prioritization and not only problem uh, problem solving um yeah definitely i feel uh you can definitely use uh, first principles in any of your decision making it's not just problem solving um, you can think through things uh, based on the facts right and then uh, bring out a solution it's basically like if you know the facts uh, you can make the best possible uh, decision right there has to be made so yeah right just to add to that uh... Yeah. the principle of first principle thinking uh, folks is uh, uh, getting to the absolute fundamentals of uh, 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 as uh, ron mentioned a fact or uh, uh, or an axiom which is the base uh, uh, the absolute smallest uh, chunk of uh, truth or information right and building everything on top of that so that's uh, first principle thinking is uh, 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 you know it's like a mental model it's a framework so it can be extended to decision making prioritization or any kind of problem statement uh, as well so it's just the way of how you approach something rather than uh, exactly fitting it to specific use cases or specific uh, uh problems right uh it's uh, it can also extend to how you live your life as well uh, uh case in point let's say if you want to get fit um uh you don't jump directly into okay you know what i'll run 20 kilometers today and then you know you feel that you know that's enough uh, to get you uh, fit you have to take a step back uh, figure out how the, your body functions as well how much uh, uh, it's it's a factor of both uh, exertion uh, doing the right exercises but also diet right like how many calories are going in etc so many it's a multi factored uh, i would say um uh, uh, situation and uh, you have to take step take a step back try to understand the fundamentals and then build uh, an approach towards uh, achieving a specific goal so yeah. think about it as a way of thinking in the first place yeah yeah sure just to add upon that right so a great first principle would be care if you want to lose weight right uh, your calories you intake right uh, should be definitely uh, less than the calories you uh, let out right so uh therefore that is like a first principle that you could consider right now that also could change based on different hormones that function in your body right 
So uh, both of these could work in accordance if you want to solve that specific problem versus with first principle thing, which is your fitness problem, right? So yeah. Um, how how big is a data set? Uh, bigger data set should you consider to validate your assumptions? Right. If I'm trying to solve a problem, made an assumption, how many people should I reach out to or how many data do I check to see the assumptions is true. Right. So uh, first of all, uh, in terms of data, right, uh, we look at data for user behavior, right? So uh, so let's say if so many people are doing this certain thing, right? It is kind of validated, right? So now you're, there is another, another caveat, right? You define what greatness looks like, right? You define key, what is product market fit? You define what is, uh, you can define all of these things, right? Maybe let's say if uh, the conversion rate is 12% or 13%, right? I say that my assumption is validated. So, uh, yeah, if you want to add something, Kushal, you can go ahead, but yeah, that's what my understanding of this question is. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't think, uh, it's a classic, uh, validation, uh, problem statement, Agrima. uh, you'll never be able to reach a large enough audience. You can't reach all your, all of your, uh, potential users to validate a new idea or a feature, right? Or a, a, a improvement to your existing product, but you'll still need to make some, um, uh, uh, also, uh, you'll still need to talk to a few users, right? To validate it, uh, just to point you in the right direction, uh, you and your team. Uh, it cannot be, uh, purely based on you build something and then you validate with X number of people. And then depending on using that data, you extrapolated to a larger audience, you have to uh, first build a solution with, uh, with the right assumptions uh, first, right? Uh, and you have to validate those assumptions with, with your ideal, uh, uh, I would say, user group. Um, it could be a small set of users you're testing the product or prototyping the product for each of them. Uh, uh, and uh, this could be via open uh, user interviews, um, it could be, uh, uh, I would say peer studies. It could be, uh, a closed, uh, validation group where you have a bunch of users uh, together and you're discussing together with them, whatever the method be, uh, may be, depending on your product, it has to be rooted with strong fundamentals, strong assumptions. Um, uh, and these user discovery sessions, user feedback sessions should be used to, uh, correct those assumptions or fill in assumptions which you've not thought of, uh, you know, as part of your original exercise. Um, you keep doing that with a few smaller batches of people. Uh, you will have a fair idea whether it's, it's going to work or not. Uh, of course, you can't uh, do that with a million people, users, right? To validate before you launch. You don't have the time or the resources to do that. Um, and hence you have to fall back on a lot of, uh, these first thing, principle thinking, uh, frameworks, right. Assumptions, uh, uh, qualitative feedback and, uh, uh, uh it's all science end of the day, uh, build a model, which you feel will work, uh, with a larger audience. And even then you, you open it up, uh, you, you launch the product for a small audience, iterate on it and you keep opening it up. Right. So it depends. It totally depends, the approach totally depends on your product, the phase of uh, the product itself, kind of uh, problems you're solving, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, there's no, uh, uh, I would say, clearly defined answer on the number or a data set for this. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to it, right? This is like classic, uh, like, are you figuring out a success metric for the product before you launch it, right? So you're going to launch it to a certain amount of people. What is your success metric, right? What specific thing should it solve? Right. And, uh, what threshold if crossed, right. You would consider this pro product a success, right? These are some things that you need to define even before you launch your product. Right. Uh, yeah. So that I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. 
Priyal says I created monthly de- I create monthly development plans but never meet them. What are some practices to keep in mind while creating a development plan? Um, I don't know. I I don't have any sort of context on this specific statement. So, like, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit, Priyal, uh, that would be great. I think Priyal is relaying a question we have received on the LinkedIn live uh, chat. Uh, maybe Priyal, you can just write to Kunal and uh, uh, to get more information. So. Uh, if a development plan means, is it product development um, or anything else which we need to know, uh, that would be great. Got it. Maybe yeah. you can answer this, uh, Rohan. Uh, any good reads to sharpen design thinking? I think uh, what comes to my mind on top of my head is uh, Marty Kagan. Uh, inspired, I think it's one of the classics. Um, what else yeah. can I think of? Honestly, honestly, um... I'm not a, I'm not like a super, I don't read, read a lot of books, right? Uh, all of what I've understood is uh, self-learning, right? Uh, like, but my, my philosophy is basically that I'll read books and uh, not, if I don't take action, right? It doesn't even matter. So I uh, focus on a lot of actions, but I don't have any, sadly, any good reads for you to sharpen your design. <laughs> I feel you should look it up on Google and uh, figure it out. But yeah. Going back to what uh, Rowan mentioned earlier, uh, maybe guys, you could you could uh, check out uh, the resources from IDEO. Go to yeah. their website, uh, check out design thinking, topics on design thinking and uh, resources there. Idea is one. Frog design is another, um, uh, which which comes to my mind on top of uh, on top of my mind. Uh, you can pick um, good, great uh, design organizations, product organizations like Airbnb or Spotify. You can go to their design uh, team blogs and then uh, find uh, specific information there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sure, Pallavi, you can do that. Hey, thanks, Kushal, and thanks a lot, Rohan. Very helpful, very informative. Uh, I'm pretty new to design thinking. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the concepts you just shared. So the problem, as in I wanted to share, was when we are into the problem-solving mode, um, Kushal, uh, sorry, Rohan. So in that scenario, you know, um, how do we, you know, put the design thinking hat on or uh, how to build that mental model to start with, to you know, to ha- apply those uh, design thinking principles that we hear of of late uh, in our day to day lives, or when we are working as PMs uh, solving real life problems. Uh, yeah. So to answer your question, right? So you're mostly stuck uh, figuring out what to do next. Am I right? Yeah. Then right. You're, you're, you've got a problem statement and now you don't know what to do next right hmm. so so uh uh to help you you're right design thinking has given you a certain framework in terms of how you should perform certain tasks right a specific process saying that maybe you empathize with your users a little bit right uh you figure out what facts are very specific to them right make a certain amount of assumptions right based on that and then try to create some sort of product based on all of the given data that you've collected, right? Be it your facts, your assumptions, right? So that you best solve the problem in a really low cost manner, right? That's what you would ideally try to do, right? Now, if you're stuck in any specific way, maybe uh, there are one out of two things, right? One is something that I think is clear. You being too idealistic to solve the problem in the first go, right? That's something that happens to me quite a lot. I don't know if it happens to a lot of people, but yeah, trying to figure out the most amount of data, right? Uh, And being a lot empathetic with your users solves most of your problems, right? So I feel whenever you're stuck with the problem statement, I feel looking into data, right? Empathizing with your users as much as possible and then going ahead and talking to these users to understand their problem deeper is something that I would suggest, right? Now coming to frameworks, right? 
there are different types of frameworks used in different in the context of different problems right so uh, based on what you are stuck with right there will be a very specific framework or uh, a specific way of thinking that could help you or give you some sort of direction to solve the problem better right uh, i don't know i hope it does i hope it answers your question but it was pretty vague uh, in but there's like no step by step guide that everyone uses right if you would ask for example just to give an example if you would ask sachin tendulkar how he plays the cover drive he would give you a very vague example or a vague step by step process to do it right but it is all again that he's done it so many times right that it's become his instinct now right but even he right doesn't know how he is doing it right and he can't explain it to someone in the finest amount of detail right so uh, yeah it's always uh, trusting in yourself uh, not being idealistic being very empathetic to your users right and then making the best possible solution that you could make in the given time and the least amount of cost right so uh, yeah i hope that answers your question absolutely yeah. and this brings a lot of clarity in my mind how do i approach a problem as an as you said rightly said right with the empathy looking at the data and then uh, choosing on the framework which best fits the context i think that's really helpful and valuable thanks ron thank you folks we still have time for a few questions so keep dropping them in your in the chat box or you can unmute yourself as well maybe i'll just uh, share uh, some anecdotes from elon musk who is uh, probably the most well known in in modern times to uh, quote uh, first principle thinking and uh, uh, and he's and who is like a, a really big practitioner of that as well right uh, so i'll give an example uh, uh, in life of elon musk before spacex so um, yeah uh, okay uh, okay i'll just complete this a uh, quick quick uh, anecdote and then we can move on to questions so uh, elon musk tries to uh, before spacex he was really passionate about uh, uh, making interspace interstellar space travel uh, possibility and uh, obviously he had not, no no uh, knowledge about how to build rockets or how rockets work uh, Uh, neither was he a rocket scientist nor was he nor did he know people who were uh, were able to build rockets in the steam so he goes to russia uh, and tries to buy uh, soviet era rockets uh, from some rich uh, russian billionaires uh, who who uh, i think who quoted are about 100 million uh, dollars uh, for uh, uh, as a price tag for one rocket uh, if i'm not mistaken uh he's clearly taken a back this like rocket should not cost so much so what he did was he got back uh, to the bay area he uh, he actually met with a lot of uh, rocket scientists uh and he read all of the theory himself he read a lot of books science chemistry uh, physics uh, aerodynamics etc and what he did was he built the formula for building a rocket from scratch from the ground up himself uh, at one tenth the cost of what uh, these russian billionaires were quoting right so his principle was very simple now what is rocket if you like uh, if you just try to uh, simplify it right it's a metal canister with uh, with a bunch of chemicals mixing and then you have an outlet for uh, the generated uh, gases from these from these chem- chem- chemical interactions now uh, that's it i mean he, he used that as a base right as a b- bottom line to build his understanding of, ro- of building rockets and eventually built spacex uh, at a super fraction of the cost for russians were building as well as a super fraction of the cost what N- nasa was building because he was able to look at the problem very fundamentally 
without having any baggage and from the ground up and uh, that is a classic example of uh, first principle uh, doing first principles right yeah for sure for sure. great example yeah Cool. We have a question, few questions uh, of Chetana. What do you think is the most critical aspect of product manager to keep in mind based on your experience? Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I'll take a stab, uh, Rohan, and then I can, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, I would say the first, uh, in fact, uh, there are a, a few of them which I feel are more critical than experience, uh, if that was what you also wanted to get to know, Chetana. Uh, as a product manager, if you're starting off from scratch, right, it's completely new for you. Uh, there are few personality traits which I feel will help you succeed, which help anyone succeed uh, in this career. Uh, first is uh, attention to detail, right? Uh, you will need to get to the bottom of understandings, what you're building and why you're building it, for whom are you building it, uh, without taking any assumptions beforehand. You have to build assumptions yourself. You have to like do your research, be really curious about, okay, you know what, this is how things work. Uh, this is how technology works. This is how like, you know, users, user behavior works. And try to build a solution for a particular problem with these principles in mind. So being very paying a lot of attention to detail and being very curious is a necessary trait for product manager. Uh, apart from that, a few things which I can, traits you can think about is user empathy. You really need to feel uh, your user's need uh, to be able to like imagine uh, or put the problem in, uh, visualize the problem in their shoes and then solve the problem for them, right? Mm -hmm. Without empathy, you'll probably not be su very successful in building uh, really touching project products, right? Um, and second, you still will have to have uh, a lot of rational thinking, a lot of uh, frameworks in place to um, approach a problem uh, rationally, right? Um, breaking it down into most fundamental parts and try to build a solution on top of it. So all of these are um, important traits uh, for product managers. More than hard work, I think you would, uh, you will be better served if you're more curious about the problem statement uh, than putting in a lot of hours uh, without uh, having that innate curiosity to solve a problem or drive to solve a problem. Yeah, uh, just to add to Kushal's point, right? I feel um, the number one thing is empathy, right? Uh, and uh, also not saying that I know my user completely, right? So if you look at the best people who look at solving problems, they always keep in touch with their users, right? And uh, try to understand really at the depths of it, care what's the fundamental problem of the user, right? So empathy in that way, from, from, from a user perspective to build a great product, but also empathy for all of your peers, right? You have uh, your designer that is working with you, right? Do you really empathize with him, right? In terms of what uh, is required to create the best possible solution, right? Your development team, right? Can you empathize with all of these people and work as a team unit because you as a product manager, right, are coordinating all of these different uh, parts of different teams, right, to function uh, really well and get your product delivered. So, yeah, that would be something that I would really think would be some sort of a critical aspect for a product manager. Um, the next question is by Priyal. Do product companies who have achieved a product market fit know how their product is going to... <laughs> look like in terms of enhancement of features six months or one year down the line? Uh, so I feel, uh, I feel that's the use case for creating a roadmap, right? Or to any sort of predictable success for a company, right? Is creating a roadmap wherein uh, you definitely want to create some sort of vision, right? In terms of what your product is going to solve for, for the next six uh, six months or one year down the line. Uh, but uh, I feel this is like, again, a pretty vague question. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I don't think uh, there is a, uh, I don't think uh, even like the best product companies know this answer for sure, yeah. like with certainty. 
uh, because uh, the, the technology landscape is moving so fast. We have new technologies coming in. AI is here. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of advances in cloud computing uh, and all the all the tech, uh, technology layers. Uh, you know, uh, from writing code to actually you know making a product work. Uh, it's a lot of change which keeps happening. That's on the technology layer. Uh, even on the user and market space, they're independently changing landscapes. User behavior uh, might not change too drastically, but it's always changing. Uh, market landscape also keeps changing. Uh, so I would say uh, you, you uh, your best bet would be to uh, optimize on your North, North Star metric, optimize on your uh, company's vision or product's vision, uh, but work with a three-month uh, roadmap. Uh, if you are like a small to mid size company, if you're a startup, then you would work with probably weeks of a roadmap, like a month <laughs> maybe is what you would uh, optimize on uh, if you're like in, in the very early stage of your journey. Uh, Sid, I think uh, has raised his hand. Do you want to like unmute yourself and drop a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Like I wanted to ask, like suppose uh, in a first principle thinking, you got some idea to build something then uh, you have a, a design thinking process. So uh, you have a mindset or you have to develop a mindset of a, a design thinking, like by take by having the mm -hmm. options, by taking the reference from the product, which is look, uh, which provide the same features, somehow the same features to the product you are about to build, or it is actually a new product. Then you uh, have, have a communication with the design team and then design teams give you some feedback and then uh, you people iterate the product manager and design team will iterate so what are the factors mm -hmm. behind iteration like for example there is a user empathy we consider uh, it's one of the point uh, for iteration what mindset uh, people have while design thinking the factors they consider uh, so i feel um, um with your question is care how do i iterate on a product right here, yeah. what would be the right way uh, and uh, what would be the like so so to answer your question right whenever you are even starting to solve a certain problem you would have defined a certain success metric right saying that here let's say there is this specific funnel that i want to solve for and if the if about 20 percent of the audience goes through this funnel maybe this funnel is a success right let looking at it a very funnel based uh, approach right now uh, for your iteration, right? Let's say, for example, you launch this product, right? 20% was your success trick uh, to say that this product is a success or this funnel is a success, right? But now your conversion rate is just 10%, right? Just 10% of people are going through uh, this specific funnel, right? Now you need to make an optimization for another 10%, right? That's okay. when you figure out what went wrong in the previous iteration that 20% couldn't be achieved, right? Or the other part is here, is my success metric too ambitions, ambitious from an industry standard, right? Both okay. of these things could be a problem, right? That's when you would understand where specifically am I going wrong in the entire funnel, right? What part of my product is not specifically working, right? And then I go to my users and get insights about that specific uh, yep. part of the product right and figure out here this can be solved in my next iteration right that's the real need for uh, iterations if uh if i can answer your question i i hope i did that mm. yes yes like experiences instincts and assumptions experiments all these factors require during iterations yeah okay thanks thank you Welcome. Okay, we have a bunch of questions, but uh, we've run out of time, uh, folks. Uh, I'll see if we can pick a few to answer uh, still. Uh, okay, uh, I, I'll, 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 uh, Jayita, it's a great question, but I think it'll take a lot much longer to uh, discuss it. Uh, we'll be doing more AI specific, um, uh, I would say star sessions. We already had two of them uh, in the past four weeks. So you can see uh, a lot of velocity a lot of uh, interest there uh, but moving on to specific uh, questions specific to first principle thinking uh i'll quickly answer venkat's uh, question are, are there any scenarios where first principle thinking will be counterproductive 
uh, it, it depends again Venkat. there's no blanket yes or no to this uh, you can't force fit a specific framework into getting a solution is how i can i would simplify the answer as well uh, you'll have to take what principles to use in what context what problem statement uh, you are uh, handling uh, for example uh, uh, first principle thinking again it's not rooted with any facts it's just how you approach something right it's just a framework so um, uh, if you use the framework incorrectly then obviously it's going to not give you the results which you are expecting right um, uh, uh, for example uh, you uh, i mean if you ignore the actual facts uh, and try to do still still do first principle thinking you might not succeed for example um, Going back to the proverbial uh, selling uh, refrigerator to the igloo, uh, sorry, uh, to Eskimos, but right, um, uh, you might have some logic into like uh, making that uh, that assumption that you know what, uh, if I do this, 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 I can sell refrigerators to Eskimos, right? But end of the day, you will make the sale uh, to the Eskimos. Like you will probably like you know sort of. Um, uh, build a convincing argument, etc. But end of the day, they won't you won't be able to use that refrigerant. So that first principle thinking for on that solutioning got you the sale, but it it is of uh, no use to the end user. Uh, so these are the uh, this is like a, a like a an example of you know how frameworks can be force fit for the solution. You always have to keep your end users in mind and couple of a lot of other parameters. Uh, right. So we have questions on um uh, i think we covered uh Arushi. Yeah. i would just like to add on that care uh are there any scenarios or context in which first principle thinking may be counterproductive so i feel uh count uh it would be like first principle thinking according to me right is a very idealistic way of problem solving right because uh finding these facts is again very idealistic if we are building products for users, uh, figuring out what uh, a fact based on behavior is, is very difficult, right? Because we have we've pushed with so much of data, right? Based on how our products are performing, right? That sometimes we might just uh, lose uh, or not figure out what the real fact is, right? Therefore, sometimes maybe it could be counterproductive. Uh, which is like being too idealistic, right? To find a solution, right? All right. Um, I think with this, we can end today's session. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, people who are on LinkedIn Live, thanks for taking the time out today um, to be with us. Um, and um, uh, again, uh, thank you, Rohan, for uh, you know uh, being here today and uh, for the session, which I think a lot of people uh, had a lot of takeaways from. So with thank this, you. we end today's uh, session, uh, folks. Um, um, as I mentioned, if you're curious to know more about what we do at PM School, uh, Priya will be reaching out to everyone who has attended today's session or email. Uh, please uh, reply back, uh, ask your questions. Uh, we'll we'll share as many uh, we'll, we'll share as much information as possible on our live code program. Um, and finally, uh, if you want to talk to any of the co-founders as well, we'll we can we can we'll be happy to have a chat with you. Uh, so with that, we end today's uh, um, star uh, session uh, at PM School. And uh, thanks again, Rohan. Um, uh, everyone have a great rest of the evening and uh, rest of the week as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you.